Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to Cave of the Cross Apologetics. And uh, unfortunately, Tony had to take a vacation away from me. So unfortunately, just get me today. But I did bring in a, a, a pastor who has taught at my church and uh, done so lovingly and amazingly. And uh, we'll, uh, I'll introduce you uh, uh, to him uh, right now. Uh, Dr. Tiberius Rada is Associate Dean of the School of Ministry Studies of and Professor of Old Testament Studies at Grace Theological Seminary in Indiana. He has a Bachelor's of Science in Urban and Region Planning, an MDiv from Golden State Baptist Theological Seminary, and a PhD in Old Testament from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He's written several books on uh, commentaries from Ecclesiastes, Ezra, Nehemiah, uh, Jeremiah, and uh, um, he's currently working on a commentary on uh, Proverbs with one of his authors that he's done. And I have to say that um, one of his uh, best series that he ever preached uh, that I've been aware of is on Exodus, and so uh, he did that at our church at Calvary Bible, and um, uh, it was really thought-provoking and made my wife do a, a whole bunch of Bible studies, so I'll include that in the uh, in the series below. So uh, thank you for coming on, uh, Dr. Rada. Yeah, thank you for, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, first off, I, I kind of want to start, uh, kind of knowing a little bit about you when we, uh, interviewed, um, uh, our pastor, uh, Brett Laird, uh, which I'll include a link. Um, he talked about his time in, uh, uh, in Ukraine and that was under communist control at the time that he was serving. You grew up in communist ruled Romania and there you, you were saved. Can you talk about that experience of coming to Christ during that like historic period? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I was born in uh, Romania in 1970. Um, it was in 1966 that uh, Nicolae Ceausescu came to power. He was the president who became a dictator over time. He was not always a dictator. He uh, he started out as the president of Romania, of the Socialist Republic of Romania, and he was also the head of the Communist Party. But over time, things got worse. Uh, so by the time I got to school, you know, when Marxist philosophy was uh, in vogue, so to speak. Uh, there is no God. That's what we were taught when we went to school. Actually, I remember in some of the classrooms, there were three uh, paintings. Uh, one was with the president, with Nikolai Ceausescu, and then the other two were uh, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, the authors of the Communist Manifesto. Um, so, you know, that, again, uh, we were taught uh, atheism, we were taught uh, evolutionism. Uh, but I knew better because I grew up in a Christian home. My parents were believers, my grandparents were believers. Uh, we, were, we would go to this small Baptist church in town. Uh, I grew up in a Fairly small town in Romania, 70,000 people. Uh, my dad worked in a diesel engine factory. My mom worked in a textile uh, factory. Uh, so, you know, lived simply, but uh, very happily uh, because, uh, again, we had a very strong uh, faith community, a very strong church. My dad was the choir director of the church, so... Um, we would be there every time, basically, the doors opened. Um, so, yeah, um, when I was 13, I gave my life to Christ. I remember uh, an evangelist came to our church. Uh, back then, Sunday mornings were basically for the edification of the church, but Sunday evenings were usually evangelistic services. And uh, the guy who came to preach was a former psychiatrist, who gave up his practice to become an evangelist. So he he was preaching about Mark 5, the healing of the demon-possessed man, and uh, gave examples from his practice. And uh, at the end, he said, you know, if Jesus can heal this guy, you know, he can heal you too. So, um, but three months earlier, my dad dreamed had a dream that I was a little demon, you know, with horns and everything. And... Uh, so that kind of gave me pause and uh, gave me something to think about. So when uh, when the preacher preached about the healing of the demon possessed man, I thought, hey, if Jesus can heal that guy, he can heal me too. So I remember uh, raising my hand and um, walking down. Uh, we had to go in front of the church, in front of everybody. And um, I actually remember October 2nd, 1983, when I gave my life to Christ. 
And then uh, in the uh, summer of 84, my dad decided to leave Romania. He had enough of the communist control. The secret police had informers in all the churches. They had informers in our church. So every Monday morning, you know, they would hear reports about what happened at church. And even my dad was, my dad was the choir director. So he would be called sometimes to the secret police to report what happened in church. And um, so he, he got, a, got sick and tired of that. And he paid a fisherman to take him across the border uh, into what used to be Yugoslavia. And uh, once he made it there, he was saved the United Nations at a refugee camp in Belgrade. So he paid a fisherman about three months wages, uh, and then he made it there, and then he made it to Italy, and then arrived in the U.S. in November of 84. Then he did the paperwork for us to come, and I came with my mom and my two older brothers in January of 86. So uh, yeah, it's been 35, 35 years, wow. Yeah, so, uh, and one of the main reasons she wanted to leave is because as evangelical Christians, we were called repenters, by the way, by the other people. We were repenters. That was supposed to be a mocking name, you know. <laughs> you, you, you repenters, you know, you guys repent of your sins. Uh, <laughs> repenters really didn't have a chance to go to the university or to make, make it. So I think my dad, one of the reasons my dad wanted to come here is to, because he heard this is the, land of opportunity and um, he wanted to give us a chance at uh, education and yeah so he was 48 when he left so we're very grateful that he um, he did that he he's turning 85 uh, actually this Friday so uh, I'm very grateful for what he did uh, for us that's amazing uh, hear, hearing stories of people uh, coming across the uh, the Berlin Wall or, uh, you know, beh behind the Iron Curtain, just all the inventive ways or uh, just dangerous ways that happen. It, it just shows you kind of the, the the spiritual aspect of humanity that kind of longs for freedom. Um, so so uh, a church wasn't necessarily like an underground underground. You, you were you were known to the authorities. Um, do you find that uh, that your community then was, I guess, more aware of of kind of the, the dual mindset that uh, I hear a lot of uh, um, uh uh, tales of people who uh, lived in, in communist ruled areas that didn't really believe the propaganda, but knew that they had to believe it. Do, did you find that there was more of a disconnect between what you were seeing versus what you were being told? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure most people did not believe the propaganda. I think they, they could see what was going on in the world. Now we were cut off from the world. You know, we didn't have, you know, social media we didn't have um you know internet we didn't have, so the only <laughs> the only thing we had is what we heard uh, and uh growing up i remember tv you know we had tv program from 8 p.m to 10 p.m and it started with uh, communist propaganda at 8 and it ended with pro communist propaganda at 10. Uh, later you know we got uh, more programming and uh, things like that but uh, you know, there was only one paper controlled by the Communist Party, <laughs> so you couldn't hear different uh, different perspectives. So, I think most people knew that what they were hearing was just propaganda. Uh, obviously, everything um, culminated in 1989 when uh, finally, you know, once the communist once communism started to fall in Eastern Europe, it was kind of like a domino effect. And we knew it was just a matter of time until it would fall in Romania. And uh, obviously it fell in December of 89 when, uh, you know, Ceausescu and his wife were caught, tried and executed for genocide, for crimes against humanity. I mean, uh, he did. Uh, he, he was crazy. I, she was even crazier. Um, they uh, killed pastors. They demolished churches. And... Um, yeah, so finally the the people said uh, enough, and since since then there's freedom, but at the same time I can tell you that the church, even though persecuted, uh, was on fire. Uh, when you went to church, when we went to church, it was standing room only. It was on fire morning, evening, whenever we went. Uh, the church was on fire. We planted churches. We would do missions in spite of uh, communist uh, uh, 
propaganda. Um, so now, you know, there's freedom in Romania, uh, but the church seems to be uh, at times lukewarm. Uh, so I think a little bit of persecution is good um, because it really tells you who is a believer and who is not. We, we did have informers in our churches, but all eventually people kind of knew who they were. Um, so I think you just have to work within, within the system. So you're saying that there's, there's hope for the, uh, the Western American church uh, today or Canadian church as well. <laughs> yeah. I think when you see what is happening with, uh, you know, pastors being jailed and uh, I, I mean, it, it's crazy what's happening in, in Canada with, with the, the Polish pastor, you know, who yeah. Was, was, yeah, I, I, I was uh, I was on another podcast and I said, could you imagine that we are uttering the words, the underground church of Canada? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do, do you find yourself um, still kind of being in, in the two mindsets of, of having to um, kind of, uh, um, you know, go, go along with the propaganda in school and, and kind of to, to live life within the society as a whole and then kind of live this uh, maybe dual aspect or, or, uh, has that kind of uh, wormed its way out of out of you by now? Well, you're talking about now. Yeah, just now. No, no. Actually, even even back then, um, and everybody knew at school. For example, they knew I was a repenter. Uh, in, in the ninth grade, I remember our homeroom teacher came and asked, "Hey, who here is a repenter?" Uh, so it was me and one of the girls from the Pentecostal church. We raised our hands and. She took our name and sent them all on. I don't know. I guess the government wanted to know who the recruiters are. But uh, I mean, we were never persecuted besides the, you know, uh, being called names, you know. And yeah, you know, we couldn't be part of the co- Youth Communist Party, you know, because we were <laughs> repenters. Not that we wanted to be, because we didn't want to be. But uh, so it, it, there was not a, there were not different compartments to life, you know. I was just a repenter. I was a believer. I was a Christian. And the same thing is happening here. I don't, I don't think you can separate, and I don't think you should separate the two. Either you're a Christian or you're not. Wherever you are, you've got to be a Christian, and it's, you've got to wave that flag. Uh, everybody should, should know who you are. Um, and I, I, think it's, I don't think it's right to, to live in different uh, spheres, so to speak, or compartments. Interesting. Um, so, uh, so you came over and uh, you uh, went to school, and uh, your your kind of career path took a a, a different take. And so, uh, I always like asking the pastors that come on that uh, you know Spurgeon tells us uh, that uh, if if any of you uh, want to take up preaching, that you should uh, uh, kind of look inward at yourself and imagine yourself doing anything else other than preaching. And if you can do that, so mm-hmm. what made you go from urban plan uh, re- and regional planning to a doctorate in Old Testament theology? Actually, uh, so I became a believer when I was 13 in Romania. I came here in January of 86. I was 15 and a half. And that spring, I turned 16. Well, uh, a guy from Romania, Joseph Tson, uh, who was educated at Oxford, he came to our church in L.A., uh, Romanian Baptist Church in Buffalo, California. And he said, communism in Romania will fall. Uh, are you going to be ready to go back and help your country rebuild physically and spiritually. And that's when I felt the call to the ministry. So I always thought I was going to go back to Romania and teach. I thought that was, that was my calling since I was 16. Mm. So when I went to college, I wanted to do something different than Bible because I knew I was going to go to seminary and, uh, and then to get a PhD because back at the time, and it's still true today, you can't teach in Romania without a PhD and uh, in the seminary level. And um, so I wanted to, initially I wanted to do architecture because I thought, okay, I need to help them rebuild physically, not just spiritually. Um, by the way, communism in Romania fell three years later. So this guy was a, was a real prophet because <laughs> he, he actually gave historical uh, evidences from the time when that happened to Romania before when we had some Romanians who went to France and got educated and then returned to Romania and rebuilt the country culturally. So he said the same thing will happen now. 
And um, again, that's when I felt a call to the ministry. So when I transferred from Long Beach City College to Cal Poly Pomona, there was a one year, one year waiting list for architecture and I didn't want to wait. So I went into urban planning because you were still in the College of Environmental Design. So I did that. Uh, I, I studied, uh, my thesis was transportation planning. And my thesis was that the electric car will never make it. So um, <laughs> I guess I was wrong. You still have hope. You still have hope. Elon's not to the moon yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had, I had reasoning. Again, I, I researched uh, at the time they said the oil companies were too strong to allow it to happen. Mm-hmm. And back then to make a, to manufacture a, a, a battery created more pollution than a saved pollution. So right. maybe things have changed. But uh, anyway, after I did that, I went to seminary. And then um, when I went to seminary, uh, I took Greek and Hebrew at the same time. Nobody told me I'm not supposed to do that. <laughs> so I, I said, if I like Greek better, I'm going to teach New Testament. If I like Hebrew better, I'm going to teach Old Testament. So I liked Hebrew better. So uh, I decided to go into Old Testament. And um, by the way, I, uh, my wife and I kept uh, uh, interviewing with mission agencies after I finished, after I started teaching at Beeson Divinity School in Birmingham, Alabama. But doors kept closing, you know, different agencies said, yeah, we're not sending, uh, you know, anybody for theological education. You can go if you want to be a church planter or, well, that was not my calling. My calling was, I always thought that my calling was to teach. So as doors closed, God opened the door for me to come to Grace. And I've been teaching uh, Hebrew and Old Testament and Bible courses in general since uh, 2005. So this is my 16th year uh, teaching both undergrad and seminary level courses. You kind of went from carpenter to uh, prophet. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Do you find parallels then between your native language and Hebrew at all? I'm I'm not sure the derivation of of Romanian. Yeah, I wish. No. (laughs) Um, It makes it a lot easier. (laughs) Romanian is a Latin language. Uh, Okay. It's actually 66% Latin. They say it's more Latin than even Italian. So, you know, along with French, Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, it's one of the Romance languages. Uh, so mostly it's Latin. We have some Germanic and some Slavic influence in the language. Um, but one good thing that happened in an educational system in Romania is that in second grade in Romania, they would give you a second for a foreign language. So I started learning French in second grade. In fifth grade, they would give you a second foreign language. Unfortunately, they didn't let me choose, so they gave me Russian. And then in eighth grade, everybody learns Latin. Uh, so that's a ni- that was a nice thing about the educational system. When I came here and I started learning, you know, I started learning English before we left Romania with a lady from church. He would teach us English. Uh, I, we didn't know it back then, but it was British English. You know, we learned. You know, <laughs> I shall, you will, she, he, she, it will, we shall. Well, nobody speaks like that here. Uh, <laughs> right. uh, we had Lips and bobbies and all that. <laughs> we we had the foundation though the the grammar we got it right so uh, at least we knew we knew grammar and uh, it was fairly easy to learn. You know, once you learn a foreign language, the others come a little easier. Uh, so then in in seminary. I had to learn uh, German, which I think was the hardest language in the world, mm. and then Greek and Hebrew, but I think Greek and Hebrew were easy compared to um, to German. But Hebrew is technically a very uh, simple language. Uh, when we study Hebrew, first year Hebrew, you learn maybe 400 words. It's a very simple language. It's not as complex as Greek, for example. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so I guess uh, kind of transitioning a little bit uh, from uh, kind of the, the Christian understanding is, is you know, we, we definitely, you know, view the New Testament as, as you know, our, our book. It's, it's you know, the, the thing that gets stapled on to the end of, uh, of Micah. And the Old Testament, though, we, we kind of only kind of pick back and, you know, we pick out the stories to teach our kids the, the flood and Adam and Eve and maybe a few from David, but not, not, uh, you know, hacking up people and, and, uh, swords going into people or, uh, uh, heaven forbid, we, we cover the, the, the banality of, of life and, uh, in Ecclesiastes. Um, it, it doesn't quite reach the kind of, uh, um, um, Marcionism, but 
what is the role of the Old Testament today in the Christian walk? Why is it still important for us to study? That's a great question. Well, uh, you know, whenever I start an Old Testament class, I always go to Luke uh, 24. It's, it's a great place to start, um, but uh, it can be it can be abused. But after Jesus raises from the dead on the road to Emmaus, you know, he's talking to the people uh, on the road to Emmaus, and you know, they're they're having that wonderful conversation. But they're not, they don't realize it's Jesus. So then Jesus is is rebuking them for not understanding that the Old Testament was about him. I mean, that's exactly what what he's doing here on the uh, the road to uh, to Emmaus, Luke 24, uh, 25. Uh, verse 25 says, And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all scriptures the things concerning himself. And then verse 44, Then he said to them, These are my words. This is after he appears to all the disciples. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So if we read the Old Testament, and if we don't see Jesus in there, Jesus rebukes us and says, Oh, foolish ones, you don't see, you know, that this is about me. So the Old Testament uh, there are two words, when we, when we think about the Old Testament, there are two words we need to remember. The Old Testament is both regulatory and revelatory. It, it reveals who God is. So even though we are not under the Mosaic Law, for example, uh, you know, we're not bound by the sacrificial system, by the dietary laws. So for that, that, that part is not regulatory for us. But it's still revelatory. It shows us who God is and what God wants from us. But even there, some people misunderstand and they say, well, okay, I'm not under the law. I have freedom in Christ. I can do what I want. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Actually, Jesus, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, he makes it clear that being under grace, not under the law, doesn't lower the bar. It raises the bar. In other words, the... The Ten Commandments, for example, are the minimum, minimum requirement. When Jesus comes, he raises the bar. In uh, Matthew 5, he says, you know, you've heard it was said, you shall not murder. But but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Uh, Verse 27, uh, again, the minimum requirement. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, again, Jesus raises the bar. Everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So being, you know, we say we're free and we live under grace, I can do whatever I want. No, 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 no. Jesus raises the bar. He doesn't lower the bar. A lot of people look at the Old Testament and say, oh, God made all these rules and regulations, you know, too high for everybody to reach. No, that's not true. Paul, when, when Paul talks about himself, he says, according to the law, I was blameless. These were not some high, high rules and regulations that nobody could keep. No, these were the minimum, minimum requirement. But what God was trying to teach his people was obedience. you got to be obedient. And again, the Ten Commandments and all the other 613 rules and regulations, they were for them what we think about as Americans as the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. Uh, That's how we should understand the law. It was not just... A, a series of do's and don'ts. No, it first, uh, it was revelatory to understand who God is, that this is a holy God who expects a holy people to worship and serve him. And he was trying to teach them obedience. He was not trying to reign on their parade. He was just trying to teach them how to live as a, as a nation. So the Old Testament, obviously I'm biased because, you know, I teach Old Testament. <laughs> but We cannot understand the New Testament if we don't understand the Old Testament. You know, I I like, you know, sometimes pastors say to people, oh, you got to start reading in John 1. 
<laughs> you can't understand John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If you don't understand Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. John relies on John relies on Genesis 1. And uh, that, by the way, happens a lot with New Testament uh, writers. You cannot understand, you know, why did Jesus have to die? You can't understand that. We can't understand that if we don't understand uh, Leviticus, the sacrificial system. If we don't understand Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, that, uh, you know, the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies once a year for to for sin, for himself and for sin of the people and to sprinkle blood on the on the mercy seat. Uh, we cannot understand why Jesus said today if we didn't understand uh, that. Uh, read the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is, is beautiful because yeah. talking to a group of Jews who are trying to get back into the obeying the the little laws and regulations of the law because they don't understand that Jesus is the sacrifice once and for all. And they don't need to bring those sacrifices anymore. And, you know, who, who is, who's the one who's circumcised? The, the one who's a, a true Jew is the one who's circumcised in the heart. So Paul goes to extremes in Romans 2 and uh, in explaining that. But we have only one Bible. We have two testaments or two covenants, to be more exact, but one Bible. So the Old Testament, everything that happens, points forward to the coming of Christ. It is in Jesus that all these covenants get fulfilled. The Abrahamic, the Mosaic, the Davidic, the, the New Covenants, all of them get fulfilled in the person and work of, of Jesus Christ. And it's beautiful when you, when you see it. And I think we do a disservice to our churches when we don't teach and preach the Old Testament because it's so beautiful. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned Exodus, for example. Uh, what does that have to do with, with, with the New Testament? Well, in the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, Luke talks about how uh, Jesus, you know, meets with uh, Moses and Elijah. And the Bible says they were talking about his Exodus. And, you know, our English versions are so poor. You know, they talk about, they translate that word departure, uh, you know, however else they translate. Well, it gets lost. And we don't understand that he's talking about the Exodus it says the exodus that he was about to do in Jerusalem. So Moses saved some through the exodus from Egypt. But Jesus is the one who is saving many through his exodus and what he will do uh, on, the, on the cross uh, for our sins. So it's, there's some beautiful, beautiful parallels that you can see uh, there. But again, those two keywords are very important. Regulatory and revelatory, and most important, revelatory. But there's also regulatory. Uh, God hasn't changed, by the way. The when you talk about uh, again, again, adultery is still adultery in the Old Testament as it is in New. That has not changed. Stealing is the same thing. It's still a sin. All, God has not changed. The moral law has not changed. But but, uh, but Jesus didn't actually say that you can't uh, can't have sex with animals. So therefore, uh, Jesus is silent on 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 the uh, the issue, right? Yeah. Or <laughs> the other one that I heard, yeah, is that Jesus doesn't directly condemn homosexuality. No, but Jesus clearly says when he's talking about marriage, uh, he's asked about divorce. He says he takes him straight to the beginning. He says, but from the beginning it was not so. And then he quotes uh, Genesis two twenty four. Uh, a man should leave his father and mother and be uh, united to his wife. That's from the beginning. Uh, God takes us back to to the original plan. And uh, again, when I talk to people, they ask me, hey, where are we? Where should we be? Well, we should be going back to the design. God's design was clear. A man and a woman in a covenant relationship. That is that is the, the standard. And by the way, my wife and I are celebrating 24 years of marriage today. So uh, it's a wonderful that we can talk about this today. Well, thank you. And thank you for giving up some of your time with that. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I like um, how we name churches, the Berean churches. And uh, and we, uh, I, I think the, probably the people that name it uh, uh, realize it, but uh, the Bereans were strumming through the, the Old Testament. Uh, that, that's that's what the source that they had there. And so uh, we should uh, we should also be encouraged with that. Or uh, everyone loves Romans. A good reform person loves Romans. 
uh, but you know, how, how much of that is, is old Testament? I mean, you, you see the, uh, the type offset in your Bible and you're, you should go, Oh, this isn't poetry that, that, uh, Paul is preaching here. He's preaching old Testament. I heard a, a funny story about a scholar, a evangelical scholar who took a class on Romans with a rabbi. The rabbi was teaching Romans. And this evangelical scholar said it was the best class on Romans I've ever heard is because the rabbi was making all the correlations <laughs> in the Testament. But at the end, the rabbi said, ah, but that's Paul. I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so see, right. it's not a matter of, uh, you know, just understanding with the mind. It is ultimately accepting, accepting it uh, in the heart, so to speak. As you know, some, you've probably heard that some people will, miss heaven by 18 inches from here, you know, to the heart, from the head to the heart. Uh, so it's it's not just intellectual knowledge, and we understand that, but we have no excuse as Christians to be lazy Christians, lazy, uneducated, especially since we can read and we have all these resources at our disposal. Uh, we should be the best students of the Bible that we can be. Right. Yeah. Amen there. Um, so does, does our current Western kind of American outlook, and obviously I'm, I'm speaking personally here, do, does my American Western outlook put up uh, uh, unnecessary uh, blinders that get in the way of studying the Old Testament? And what can I do to help combat that? Yeah, you know, it's, it is interesting. And sometimes it's writings of, of well-known people that you probably, maybe you discussed, you know, they're, trying, they're saying unhitched from the Old Testament. I don't know if you've heard that expression lately. Uh, <laughs> it came into a, a writing by um, Andy Stanley, and you can edit that out if you don't want the name to be there. <laughs> no. He's the one who, who said, you know, you got to unhitch from the Old Testament. And uh, again, uh, as you mentioned, when Jesus is here and he's talking about, and he's talking about, you search the scriptures because uh, they reveal the, how you can have eternal life. They talk about me. Well, he's talking about the Old Testament. Uh, the, the Bible that uh, the apostles said, that Paul had, was the Old Testament. Uh, so, uh, again, not to think about, uh, think about the pastor, for example, being a chef and preparing food. Uh, it would be like the Old Testament, two-thirds of the menu, and the New Testament, one-third. And you're just feeding... The, the the people just one third of the of the menu. It's, I mean, it's it's good stuff. Don't get me wrong, but it is it is dependent on the Old Testament, and probably that's not a good analogy. But anyway, I'm hungry, so I guess <laughs> make uh, an analogy. No. Okay, uh, that's, that, that's fine. That, that that works for us. I try to make sports analogies, and uh, the, the touchdowns and the home runs get uh, get get mixed up in my mind. Okay, well, <laughs> I I, th I think I, I think it is. I think it, I think the pastors have a very important uh, job, and it's if the pastor loves God and His Word, he will uh, do what Paul says: preach the whole counsel of God, not just parts, not just. And you know that's why it's I love when churches preach through books. So that's why when I, I was at Calvary, I was able to preach through Genesis, preach through Mark, and then when I came back, preach through Exodus. And actually, our church right now is going through Exodus uh, here. So uh, it, it's, and, and, and people always come say to me, I, I never knew that is there. It's the Old Testament is so rich. So I think that if the pastors teach the Bible to their people, uh, people will, again, the Holy Spirit is active and working and uh, they will grow and they, they will love the word of God and they would want to go back and, and, and learn it. I have a friend who's uh, reading the Bible chronologically, and she, mm. she goes that every every year, and she loves it. You know, she discovers new new things, and that's how I am. I, I've been reading the Bible my whole life, and I still read, and I'm like, wow, this was here. I never seen this before. Well, I'm sure I read it before, but sometimes the Holy Spirit uh, acts in such a way that it, it hits you where you need it at, the, at that time. That's why uh, it's it's so rich in. Uh, again, um, if the if the pastor loves God and His Word, he will teach and preach the whole counsel. Um, and again, my preference is to always go through books. You know, do an Old Testament book, then the New Testament book, and then you alternate. There's so so much uh, richness of material. Yeah. 
Yeah, our, our church did a Bible in the year, and we had a, a Wednesday class where we had a discussion point, and we mostly stayed in the Old Testament because we knew the New Testament so well. And there was just so many things that, that uh, came about from that. And uh, I picked up a book and p- then picked up multiple books, as, as you can see from my, uh, my extensive library behind me, a G.K. Beale, where he's walking through just motifs that, that play out again and again through Scripture. And uh, I think that was one of the big things that, that struck me was h- how much God has to repeat himself. And he repeats himself in, in these word pictures as well. Uh, and I, I was like saying, you know, uh, the, the, the Bible isn't just this list of rules, but we have people's lives in there to say, here's, here's, here's kind of a foil where, uh, you know, I, I can be like David in the best of times. I can also be like David in the worst of times. And, um, I, 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 I enjoy, I enjoy learning those, those different aspects there. Um, kind of, uh, b- before we kind of transition the, the interview here, um, there are, there are other teachers like um, Michael Heiser or John Walton, uh, while, uh, of course, uh, no one agrees with anybody on, on everything. Um, they encourage looking at this, this greater Eastern world uh, that, that uh, the, the proto-Israelites, the, the Hebrews uh, take place in. How important is it for us to know this kind of Eastern, old Eastern world mm. and its influence on Old Testament understanding? Well, um, we, I used to use uh, John Walton's book, Ancient Near Eastern Thought, in my biblical backgrounds class, which is exactly that. And I think it's, it's very important to understand the cultures of the Old Testament world. Uh, for example, uh, in, in Genesis, uh, it, is import, uh, it is important to understand that when Moses is writing, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, that was not the only story around. Uh, the ancient or Eastern people, the Mesopotamians, had their own creation story, so to speak. But in their creation stories, you know, you had gods fighting with other gods. You know, in the Enuma Elish, you have Tiamat and Marduk fighting for the supremacy of the pantheon. And Marduk is cutting Tiamat in half. And from her upper body, he forms the heavens. And from her lower body, he forms the earth. You know, it's very convenient. Uh, the Sumerians had stories about creation, you know, that involved uh, gods having orgies with other gods. Uh, the Egyptians had creation stories, you know. The god Num was sitting on his father's wheel and forming uh, the man, but he didn't have power to give him breath, so he calls his wife. His wife comes and breathes life into the into the clay, and the, the clay becomes uh, human. And It is on that background that God inspires Moses to say, no, creation creation was not chaotic, Uh, creation was not uh, immoral. In the beginning, God says, I created the heavens and the earth. One, two, three, four, five, six. God is a very powerful God who creates everything in six days. He's a God of order. Uh, There's nothing chaotic. So it is important to understand but for a matter of contrast, not to say, oh, see, Moses plagiarized the Enuma Elish, or Moses plagiarized the Gilgamesh epic, and that's how he is, he's talking about the flood. No, you can find parallels between the stories, but there are differences between those stories. The Bible is the inerrant word of God, who's inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit inspired his people to write. It's very different than ancient Near Eastern uh, stories. Uh, so it is important to understand the language, for example, that they're using, uh, concepts that they're having, but not uh, to say that, oh, so this is exactly what's happening in the Old Testament, because it is not. Um, for example, in Exodus, when you talk about Exodus and we talk about the plagues, yeah, it is important to understand that the Egyptians uh, had a pantheon of gods and they worshipped many gods and goddesses. And understand also what Exodus is supposed to be, what the plagues are supposed to be. In Exodus 12, God says, the plagues are judgment against the gods of Egypt. God says, I'm going to punish and I'm going to judge Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt. And that's what the, the, the plagues are. The plagues are a slap in the face of all the gods of Egypt to prove that they're nothing. But Yahweh, he's the true, uh, the true God. So, yeah, I, I think it's very important to understand but let's not make those things the main thing. They are just background for us to understand uh, what Scripture says. Right. And uh, I, I will uh, include in our show notes uh, below uh, uh, some recommendations uh, uh, that I have for, for our audience there. 
Um, you, you've written on uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, Jeremiah, Ecclesiastes uh, by Solomon. Uh, what have some of your biggest takeaways been from them? And uh, it, it was funny, uh, you mentioned uh, Marduk. I, I was reading your commentary on Ezra, and I kept uh, m- misreading it as Marmaduke, and I had to remember he's the the dog. Uh, <laughs> Marduk is, is the god. So so I had those uh, mixed up in my own mind a little bit. <laughs> well, um, Ezra and Nehemiah was uh, one of the first commentaries I, I have written. So the first publication I had was, the New Covenant Motif in Jeremiah's Book of Comfort, which was my PhD dissertation. And I was working on the New Covenant, uh, which basically I argued that the New Covenant in Jeremiah is not a brand new covenant, but a renewal of the old covenants in many in many ways. So it's not brand new. There are some brand new elements, like the law written on the heart. Obviously, that's through the Holy Spirit. Yeah. But there are many a renewal of the elements of the old covenant. Anyway, that was the first one. And Ezra and Nehemiah, I enjoyed that because I got to write about uh, the the nice part about the prophets. You know, when <laughs> you, you talked about how people give up reading the Old Testament because it's repetitious sometimes. I mean, think about it. Look at all the prophets. They write about three things: sin, judgment, restoration. Sin, <laughs> judgment, restoration. So he repeats all the time. I had a friend who told me I I, I stopped reading Jeremiah because it's just about sin and judgment. Well. I said, hey, keep reading, keep reading, it's coming. So Jeremiah 30 to 36 is the, the, to 33 is the good, the good news, the book of comfort, the book of consolation. So uh, in the prophets, God always says, also says to the prophets, you have sinned, because you have sinned, I'm going to judge you, I'm going to take you into exile. But God also promises restoration. And that's what Ezra and Nehemiah is. Ezra and Nehemiah talks about God's faithfulness in the fact that he actually fulfills his word and he's faithful to the fact that he brings them back to the land. And just like there were three main deportations from uh, uh, Israel to, to Babylon in uh, 605, 597, 587 BC, there are three returns from exile under Zerubbabel, under Ezra, and then under Nehemiah. And uh, I get to talk about the restoration, how they come back to rebuild the uh, altar, to give sacrifices. They rebuild the temple, they rebuild the wall. And all of these things are, are miraculous. And uh, by the way, there are so many parallels to the Exodus in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to see when you, when you, when you study it. Uh, but uh, Ecclesiastes was probably my favorite so far. Uh, it's because a lot of people like Ecclesiastes for all the wrong reasons. You know, they say, oh, I love Ecclesiastes because, you know, when I'm depressed, I like to read uh, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. Well, the whole point of the book is that apart from a right, correct relationship with God, right. it would be meaningless. That is the point. Uh, and I do think that at the end, Solomon sees the light and says, Fear God and keep His commandments. That is the whole duty of uh, of man. And uh, talk about how Ecclesiastes points to Jesus. Jesus came to redeem us from the meaninglessness Solomon experienced. And you know, if if Solomon says, "Oh, you know, I hated work," you know, and I, you know, it's meaningless. No, Jesus comes and says, and we we learn in the New Testament that everything we do should be for the should be for the glory of God. Or <laughs> Think about what Solomon writes in Proverbs. He first says, he who finds a good wife is a gift from the Lord. And then Ecclesiastes 7.26, he says, more bitter than death is the woman. Like, oh, what happened? Well, what happened is a thousand women happened. <laughs> uh, he, he consistently disobeyed uh, God and his law. That's what happened. So he comes to the end of his life and says, everything is meaningless. But I, I read Jesus and I said, no, I, that's, that's not my perspective. My perspective is, uh, uh, again, a man and a woman in a covenant relationship before God. A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And again, Jesus is quoting uh, Genesis there. So Jesus uh, redeems us from all the meaninglessness Solomon experienced. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and I came that my people have life and have it abundantly. So a lot of people like Ecclesiastes because they want to, you know, uh, maybe uh, quote Ecclesiastes on their bad days, you know, oh, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. No, if you are saved, 
your your motto shouldn't be meaningless. Your motto should John 10, be John 10. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That's that's my motto. It's not meaningless. Apart from a correct relationship with God, everything is meaningless. So if people choose to reject God, then yes, they should sing that uh, refrain. But if we are saved, then we're not singing that refrain. We're singing a different tune. I, I really enjoyed uh, uh, reading Ezra and Nehemiah together and just uh, watching them um, kind of, it, it's it's almost post-apocalyptic uh, literature to me because they're coming back into the land and rebuilding it. They they build for the, for them the, the English channel, uh, uh, a tunnel, uh, two def- different elevations, and it just happens to meet right in the middle. I mean, as as, a, as an architect fan, you probably uh, probably got at least some of uh, uh, joy out of uh, the, re- the rebuilding of aspect of it. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, are, are there still aspects of uh, apologetics or scholarship that uh, that is left to explore in Old Testament, or are we kind of just so far away from those elements that we're just kind of uh, kind of blowing our straw paper at it and, and seeing if we we can knock down any targets and seeing if is, you know if it'll stick against the wall? Are we too far removed and and you know the sands of time have have uh, have done away with everything, or are there still really important questions to answer? Uh, from the Old Testament, you mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh no, that definitely. Uh, <laughs> we're not. We're not too far removed. Again, if, if if we understand the New Testament, we can only understand it fully in light of the Old. There, there is no way. For example, even think about the concept of when Jesus says, "I am the good shepherd." The shepherd gives his life for the sheep. We cannot understand that fully apart from understanding that in the Old Testament times, a leader was called a shepherd. Shepherds were leaders. They were not just, you know, shepherd of sheep. Uh, Ezekiel 44, for example, talks about the shepherd, the evil, the wicked shepherds of Israel, who, you know, just feed themselves. Um, and then the psalmist writes, the Lord is my shepherd. You know, for someone in ancient Near East, they would understand that concept that doesn't just mean a shepherd who leads sheep. That means a leader to be followed. Uh, so we have that actually in the English language, right? The shepherd is the pastor of the church, right? The pastor of the church. That is the word for shepherd. But he's not just leading sheep. He's got to feed sheep. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I mean, all these concepts, uh, the New Testament concepts, are are born in the in the Old Testament. Even the the, the coming of the Holy Spirit, we just celebrated Pentecost Sunday. Well, let me rephrase that. The Christian church in the world celebrated Pentecost. Probably most of our churches never mentioned it. But anyway, I see that's another departure. We're, see, we're, we're even departing from the New Testament times. Yeah. We're departing from Old Testament times. Yeah. As heard, a, uh, a so-called pastor said that, unfortunately, he has to teach from the Bible still. Uh-huh. I mean, what, what other book do you want? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, the, the Pentecost, for example, uh, w- was prophesied by Joel. I, I mean, you, you have clear, direct prophecy from Joel to Acts chapter 2. You can understand one without the other. And actually, that's even more important because Joel also prophesies about not just the coming of the Spirit, but end times. There is a time when that's some some of the prophecies that have not yet been fulfilled. So we're talking about second coming of Christ. Isaiah talks about that. You have Zechariah talking about. You have Joel talking about that. So to ignore Old Testament is to ignore end time prophecy, and which is by the way another whole topic that I'm sure uh, you covered at some point. But all those things are have originated in the Old Testament. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the the idea that uh, 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 the uh, the the return can't happen because Cyrus reads the uh, the Old Testament and finds his name there. I mean, it, it just can't happen then because you know prophecy would be real then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, um, that's interesting. So, uh, going now to to your role as as dean and professor, um, do you see apologetics playing 
a, a, a greater role today uh, than maybe when you first started? Or is it, is it less? Is it different questions? What, what are you seeing some of the, the struggles or questions or focuses that, um, that your students are bringing into or reporting back to you? Yeah, well, obviously apologetics, we always do apologetics in all our classes. Uh, we actually have a class on apologetics for biblical study students, seminary students actually take a class on apologetics. But uh, obviously apologetic issues come up in every class. What, what's, what's different today, I would say that uh, we have a lot more students that don't know the Bible. Um, for example, if an uh, introductory Bible course, if I ask how many of you have read the whole Bible in your lifetime, very few will say that they have. Uh, if I ask, uh, okay, from zero to 10, what's your knowledge of the Bible? I had uh, the whole spectrum from zero to, to 10. So there's a lot more biblical, uh, biblical illiteracy, um, which is interesting because we have much more information, but then we, we know less because we read less. We, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. That's why I, I prefer my classes to have still, uh, paper copies of books. Uh, I want them to actually have the book in hand, although our technology, technological advances dictate that we go more to even electronic copies. I, I just don't like that. So I would, I would rather use an older book rather than a newer book if I know that the student has, has it in their hands. Um, so there's a lot more biblical uh, illiteracy. Um, uh, I, I think a lot of people are, are abandoning the idea that there is such thing as objective, absolute truth. So in our classes, we have to uh, ingrain in them and to teach them, hey, the Bible is the word of God without error. And there is absolute objective truth. God is the moral lawgiver and he's giving us uh, laws. We need, we know how to live our lives. Um, so, I don't think we have changed uh, and what we do has changed. We just have to be a little more emphatic into realizing, hey, our students that are coming in now are not really, um, you know, they didn't, they didn't grow up in the church. They don't, they don't know the stories. Uh, even they don't know, some don't know, you know, David and Goliath, you know, they don't know that story. They, yeah. So it's, <clears throat> Uh, to comment, grace is still good because they, they do get a class in exploring the Bible and they get a class in scripture and interpretation, which is basically hermeneutics class. And then they take a class, essential doctrinal themes. And then I teach a class, Christianity and critical thinking, which is a philosophy class uh, with, uh, again, from a Christian perspective, we learn critical thinking, but like the Bereans, like you said, that we look in scripture and to see what the Bible says about these things. Uh, so uh, things have changed. Uh, we are a Christian institution, but uh, we, we still get students that are not believers. So I treat my classes as a mission field. Mm. I teach and preach the gospel all the time. I give students a chance to uh, I implore them to give their life to Christ. Um, uh, there are people who give their life to Christ. I had atheists in class. Uh, then after they graduated, they gave life to Christ. Uh, there are atheists who come and leave and they're unchanged. Uh, but um, our role has not changed. Uh, my job is not to convince them. That is the role of the Holy Spirit. My job is to teach them what uh, the Bible says. So yeah, apologetics will always play a very, very important role. I always say that uh, we're the wire in between the source of the light and the light bulb as the, as the person. I'm I'm okay with being being the the guy that can uh uh you know uh, stumble on his words for the gospel, but it's it's ultimately God who has the uh, the hard job of uh, forming the heart of stone into a heart heart of flesh. I'm glad I don't have to <laughs> do that job. Yeah, I like that. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Um, uh, one of the questions that we always ask towards, towards the end and to all our, our, um, our people that come on is where do you see the future of apologetics, either when it comes to Old Testament or in seminary or just the greater Christian context? Can you speak explicitly on what you think may, maybe the future of apologetics is? Well, again, I, I can tell you as far as uh, educational systems, 
and especially I'm thinking about Christian school, I think you will always have a very important role uh, to play. Again, as I said, we we have the class in undergrad, we have the class in the seminary, um, and it's very important. And we have to also, that has to trickle into the church as well. And uh, we always have to provide a defense for our faith. Uh, and that also always starts with knowing what the Bible says. And um, so I'm grateful for what you guys are doing and uh, keep keep doing it. Uh, I know, I'm sure there there's, uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, there's spiritual warfare that uh, Satan would be happy for you not to do this this work, but you got to keep, keep it going. And uh, uh, in spite of uh, opposition, uh, as I write in the Ezra Nehemiah commentary, opposition is si- as a sign that you're doing something right. right. It's not a sign that you're doing something wrong. So. Great. Um, uh, because you're a professor, I, I don't mind asking you this question. Is there a, a, a couple of books or resources that you think um, – might benefit uh, uh, people who want to look more into uh, the, the Old Testament, uh, other than your commentaries that, of course, I will leak. <laughs> well, um, yeah, definitely. So uh, may, maybe what I can do is send you a list of my Old Testament commentaries. Uh, I have recommendations for each book of the Bible. Perfect. Um, but... Um, Genesis, if you're to read Genesis, you need Creation and Blessing by Alan Ross, for example. That is, a, is an amazing book for pastors and, and lay people who just want to dig deeper into the Old Testament. Alan Ross is great because he writes, uh, he, 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 he studies deeply, but he writes uh, as all of us can understand. He's, he's not... Um, he doesn't just uh, speak from the ivory tower. He understands what he's talking about. As far as uh, Old Testament books as a whole, um, again, in undergrad, I use just a basic encountering the Old Testament class, uh, into encountering the Old Testament book, which is basically just an introduction to the Old Testament. Uh, but probably... Um, <clears throat> There are classic ones out there by uh, published by Moody uh, some time ago. And again, I can send you that information with uh, the, the recommended books I recommend for, for that. I mean, I would appreciate that. I don't know if my wife would appreciate that. And I might have to add some more bookshelves. But uh, yes, uh, I, I, I'm um, grateful for your work. I, I mm-hmm. um, use your uh, studies um, in uh, my Logos uh, studies when, whenever I... I'll pull those up. So unfortunately, I, I didn't get the physical copies uh, for you, but uh, but uh, I, I make a lot of notes, so it's nice to, to reference them that way. I like Logos. I have Logos. I use it a lot in my sermon preparation. It's it's a beautiful thing, yeah. uh, but I, I still like uh, physical copies. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I haven't quite made the switch over yet, but uh, uh, when I make more notes, it's it's nice to, uh, to, to mark up a digital copy. Um, is, is there a, anything else that uh, you wish I would have asked you, uh, or uh, can you, um, um, if, if not, can you uh, kind of uh, relay people on, on where they can um, check you out uh, and um, maybe plug your, your school if you'd like? Yeah, well, um, yeah, I'm, uh, so obviously I've been at Grace College and Theological Seminary uh, since 2005. It's uh, just grace.edu. To get there and you again we have undergrad programs we have seminary uh, master programs actually we even have a new program uh, deploy which is basically competency-based education so let's say uh, Patrick you're uh, let's say you're on staff at Calvary and uh, you don't have a, a master's degree you can actually complete it from where you are it's called competency-based education and it's different than online because uh, you can go as fast or as slow as you want. So you can finish a competency, let's say, let's say Old Testament, you can finish it in a, in a month rather than, hey, you have to wait for everybody to finish their class in three, three months. So it's, it's designed for you and it's designed for someone who's already in ministry. Uh, they get their ministry experience uh, while they're going to school. So there are many great things that are happening at Grace, um, even with COVID. Actually, our numbers are looking really good for next year. 
We are still a strong uh, evangelical school. We believe the Bible is without error, uh, and we still teach that, and we believe that, uh, and we are unapologetic in, in doing so. Great. Well, Dr. Rada, I greatly appreciate your time today. I greatly appreciate you answering my questions, and uh, thank you for, for coming to Calvary every once in a while and preach. It just means more homework for me afterwards when my wife has a bunch of questions, and I say, <laughs> let me get you his email, because now I have it, and uh, sometimes I think she st- stumps you with uh, with a few questions every now and then. So uh, I, I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for your time, and uh, thank you uh, for you and your wife's uh, uh, testimony in, in your marriage. Thanks, Patrick, and thanks for having me. Thank you. Perfect.